Okay, are we starting? I think we are. Are yeah. we allowed to say hello to each other first? <laughs> yes. Really good to see you, Georgie. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. We've, we, I've talked to some of the people from right back at the very beginning, but I think you're really important because you've straddled that sort of middle bit to the last bit. Well, not last yet, but last bit for me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, Thank that's you. really good. Thank so, um, <laughs> do you know, I, I just I want to just say as well, as I've been reflecting on some of your questions that my my name recollection is sometimes a little yeah. bit rubbish. And uh, if if I'm talking about something and you you remember the people, I know that, that one of the questions is around sort of naming people who feel important. And, and yeah. I, I've got a few kind of little memory kind of gaps. So if, if I if I'm having a memory gap, I know you're not probably supposed to prompt me but um if you oh, yeah. do that's okay <laughs> yeah no this is lit i mean it's literally just a conversation i think the final first product will be a short film mm -hmm. and it'll be a narrative really mm -hmm. for some of some of the just some of the stories I, yeah, yeah yeah no I, it's perfect it, we'll so just chat and see how it goes we just chat yeah so who was who were the sort of people who were important to you so um i, I was going to start with uh lauren curzon storer yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Lauren set up the first Masters in Genetic Counselling um, in the UK and actually across uh, was the first one in Europe and um, that was such an important uh, part I think of our developing profession because it was the first kind of bespoke um, training for genetic counsellors um, in the UK and in Europe and was a, 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 a um, a, a training absolutely designed for um, developing the genetic counselling um, profession and uh, that was my first introduction to genetic counselling. Okay. I was um, uh, in one of the, the first years of, of the master's programme in, in Manchester so um, I think Lauren curzon Storo has, has been um, very key uh, in, in um, launching I guess a, a specialist uh, training mm -hmm. route and of course it's now um, been developed from there with more master's courses and the STP training um, in genomic counselling but it, it did all, all start with that first MSc course in, in Manchester that was uh, delivered um, by Tara Clancy and Rona McLeod and supported by David Crawford and Di Donai and, and many people in Manchester kind of um, helped launch that first training programme. So what how did you hear about, this is sort of a side side question, but how did you hear about genetic counselling? What made you decide this is what you wanted to explore? Um, uh, many things in life are a bit fortuitous. So I was doing um, genetics in Cambridge and uh, one of my colleagues um, in my final year genetics, her father worked at Manchester University and had heard that there was a new programme coming. Um, and uh, so I was lucky enough on the grapevine to hear about um, uh, an opportunity to uh, bring my genetics science, which I loved, um, uh, in, into working with people, which uh, was very much where I was was drawn to work. So it was it was very fortuitous, really. I have to I have to say it was it had been mentioned to me by um, some other medical friends of the family uh, earlier that uh, um, within genetics, there were genetic nurses and genetic social workers. And so looking back, it had been mentioned as, a, mm -hmm. as, a, as an area of, of medicine that was growing, but I, I think I hadn't really paid too much attention at the time. And then it was when I actually heard there was a course that I could apply for that that's, that's what brought me That's here. what you did. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And how, how did you get involved in the sort of development of the profession? Can you remember how you sort of met the first people who said, right, Georgie, you can do this? <laughs> <laughs> so I was reflecting around around that, that journey. Um, uh, I guess as one of the first master's graduates in England, um, in the UK, I, I was um, quite... Um, aware that this was this was a, a new route for um, 
for genetic counselling and that there were a lot of um, departments that were, were developing their clinical genetics departments and there were um, uh, established, well-established genetic nurses and genetic social workers and, and um, the AGNC. And I was trying to remember if it was still called the AGNC or whether we were the genetic nurses and social workers association when I first um, was applying. But I, I remember fairly soon after I, I started work feeling it would be um, important for the profession for me to apply to be on the agency committee so that there was okay. representation of um, MSC trained genetic counsellors and an opportunity to um, be visible and contribute and to kind of bring together the different training routes. So I, I applied quite early on to be on the AGNC committee and that was really my, my first opportunity and, and really um, key, I think, in, in being able to uh, get into a national space and, and learn a bit more about what was happening in other um, departments and, and with the profession um, generally. And yeah. I, I think um, one, of my, uh, one of my little anecdotes, um, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Uh, in those early days in the AGNC, there was, um, we, we were really kind of learning how to, how to integrate genetic nurses and genetic counsellors. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of um, discussion around uh, different routes of, of training. And um, I, I remember, I really strongly remember when we uh, had a sense that in the United States, there were two professional groups, one for the counsellors and one for the nurses. And, and we were really thinking carefully um, in the UK about uh, uh, I think that kind of strong consensus that we didn't want to go down that line and that we um, wanted to um, uh, value and represent our our sort of skills mix um, in England between the, the different training routes into genetic mm -hmm. counselling. And, and um, one of my first tasks in the agency was, was designing the logo. Um, and, <laughs> And and it was a terrible logo, and I knew nothing about designing logos. But we put the N and the C overlapping each other as as a kind of statement that the nurses and the counsellors were were together in in this sort of professional group. Um, so. I never realised so much thought had gone to it. Into it, I must admit. <laughs> yeah, but that was great, actually. <laughs> Had the registration system appeared by then, or were you so, so I, through your masters before that formalisation of it? So I I had done the masters before the registration came. Yeah. So I I finished my masters in 1995, and our registration started in in 2000 2001. We we were kind of right. developing it, um, and so I wasn't. Um, directly involved with with that first group that were putting together mm -hmm. the whole um uh competency and scope of practice and so I, I guess my my kind of second uh list of the second person on my list of who's been really key in in the development of the profession would be um uh i, I guess the group working alongside heather skirton and yourself chris um in in putting together and defining what um what genetic counselling was, what our scope of practice was, what our skills were, what our competencies were, um, and how to, um, uh, uh, I guess, define the education and training that would be uh, required to achieve that level of, of competency. And um, that, uh, as you say, was, was uh, kind of um, really key in how we as a profession uh, tackle this this question of, of different training routes and, and how as a profession we, we drew together all of those uh, that sort of skills and knowledge base into one registration that would allow people from different backgrounds to to demonstrate those those core competencies to work as a genetic counsellor. Yeah I think I think that I'm so glad we persisted in 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 that journey it was um, it was not a given at the beginning, um, but the reality was there was probably only about 120 of us in the country anyway. So it didn't seem much point in splitting further, even if we hadn't believed in it as a fundamental principle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I yeah. think it's still right. I think it's even more important today, in fact, with, with the developments. But we'll go on to that, I guess, 
if we well we could go into it now or we could do this sort of in a linear fashion <laughs> uh we'll we'll stay linear shall we we'll stay linear. Yeah, so where have we got to we've got to the registration process and mm -hmm. then you getting involved in thinking through competencies what genetic counsel it is and the agency you can't remember i'm really hazy on who was chair and all that kind of thing of the AGNC round about the sort of 90s and early 2000s. You can't remember who was chair when you were there, can you? So I was chair for a year. Mm -hmm. but I, I told I, you I was hazy. <laughs> but I can't actually remember what year. I'd probably have to, I've probably got it on a CV somewhere, would remind yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but um, Amanda Barry. Right, um, yes. Um, Yes, I'm. I'm a little bit hazy too. I do have all of the. Um, I, I've got so much paperwork in my office. I do have all my old files, and and um, these things yeah. could be mapped out at some stage. Yeah. But um, I. Uh, so yes, I. I. I, I think I, I. can't remember. I. I do know I was one of the first people to apply for registration, and that we. Right. There was a small cohort of us that um, uh, did the first route of registration in order to then become the assessors for yes yes uh, yeah I can remember that process whereby we didn't have anybody registered so who do you get to do the assessors and who do you get to be on the board mm. so of course all the first board were non-registered genetic counsellors because they couldn't register and Penny as the chair was not registered <laughs> until a little while afterwards yes yeah. yes yes the, the board formed before registration started didn't yeah. it yeah yeah yeah, yes. and that was Penny and Heather and you and Chris Barnes? No, I wasn't on the board at all. No, I wasn't. Um, I sort of, I went off into academia for a while and, and, and didn't, didn't do as much practical stuff. But I know Penny was definitely the first chair of the board and very integral to that. And then it was Alison Lashwood. Okay, yes. After that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I remember we did have discussions about how... You know how how to do this, and of course the the reality is there is only one way because because you you can't do it any other way. Yeah, yeah. What was it like going through the registration for the first time? Because it was it onerous? Was it clunky? Was it did it feel exciting? Uh, it felt exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I I um I have uh, I I've I valued the the process of 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 um, being able to put together evidence around what we did and to yeah. put that forward for for it to be kind of recorded and looked at and assessed and fed back um i i i remember enjoying it it was very paper based when i did it yeah <laughs> and you had interviews um, didn't you we did you and i then yes. i then did lots of interviews and i thoroughly enjoyed that and uh, i i i um you know i i i think running this sort of running something like registration on a, on a large scale across England is a, is a huge undertaking. And, and mm. I know being on the GCRB myself um, currently, but um, uh, I, I think uh, the opportunities in the early days to, to, um, uh, to, to view a set of competencies and to spend some time reflecting on practice and, mm. and um, evidencing that a, a very um, good and satisfying Kind of opportunity really to 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 grow as a genetic counsellor and to see where my practice could develop and improve and and uh, um, yeah. yeah and and it wasn't so onerous that it it made me feel this wasn't a, a doable thing mm. for the profession mm. I was I was then keen to support other people doing it and I did a lot of mentoring yeah. for quite a number of years after that and enjoyed that enormously yes yeah and of course, that whole registration then opened the door to so many other opportunities um, for for the profession to grow. So it, it gave a route for more masters to to open and to be accredited by the GCRB. And then we um, we had that uh, Department of Health um, um, money that came in to support the actual training process. And we had those um, Department of Health trainees for a while that that. Um, uh, really uh, embedded and, and supported that two-year um, training that we mm -hmm. we recognised was important for genetic counsellors to 
develop the the competencies for registration and uh uh, yes. Had it not been for that definition of, of registration, we wouldn't have been able to um, to achieve those things. So, no. no. So, what was next for you? You registered. You're mentoring. <laughs> so, I, I think I was I was very lucky because I had I had um, uh, been on the agency committee in my younger kind of career that I. Um, I then got the opportunity to to think a little bit about what next with registration. And I remember when registration first came in, Penny and um, Heather and and um, the conversations sort of were around um, the uh, the the opportunity to to um, uh, define our scope of practice and define who we were um, mm. alongside what was happening with other professions allied to medicine, this mm. group of hands. Um, and that um, uh, I think uh, that the uh, profession would want to kind of further develop registration into into um, something that was kind of recognized and, and um, eventually statutory regulated. And so uh, I, um, I, uh, was part of, I can't quite remember how it formed, but um, was part of the uh, Genetic Counselor Statutory Regulation Group, which I um, then chaired and, and led yeah. um, uh, as, it, as it developed. And I think that must've been about 2006 that we started. Yeah, that. I, can't, I can't remember how it happened, but certainly sort of 2005, 2006 was when I ended up being more engaged in clinical practice again. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I can't remember how we it was probably the people I it was maybe the people that had been sort of around for a bit creating the board and everything sort of said well we we need to do this next but it needs to be a bit refreshed mm -hmm. and have different people in and that was when the and it needs to and I suppose the board was set up as a separate organization which is right and the Joint committee. What needed to be? They need to be the board involved, but also the AGNC involved. So maybe it was something around that at the time. Yes. I think at the time we we had a bit of a culture with setting up working groups. Yeah. In in quite a sort of organic way, it was yeah. um, was recognised that there was too much. There were different bits of work to do and too much work for one one group to do. Mm. And um, uh, this was the next piece of work to look at. Um, uh, how how the profession would move towards being a regulated profession and um, I, yes I think we didn't formally at the beginning um, feel it was a joint GCRB AGNC yeah, it was more true. kind of the people who were interested who who would would put the work together and I, yeah um, yeah we I think that right, both just groups, just it was a, just a loose working group yeah, I think it was. We were a bit of a loose working group. <laughs> we were a bit of a loose working group, but one learns. <laughs> we had to become a lot tighter <laughs> as time went on. <laughs> um, Did we ever write minutes? <laughs> Not for a long time, I don't think. <laughs> no. We, we had actions, but yeah, we didn't we lots of write them down. We, had, yes. we did a lot of work as a group, but I'm not yes. sure we formally minuted any of it. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Yes, and even though uh, Chris Barnes, she's another person that absolutely needs a needs a name in 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 our history. But um, yeah. uh, Chris Barnes, particularly through all the statutory regulation work, she wasn't formally our our secretary in any sense. But her her amazing skill in in um, in organisation and attention to detail did copious amounts of of work um, for for that sort of application process. So I think many of us. Um, uh, did a lot of kind of thinking and writing a few bits and pieces, but it was Chris who absolutely put it all together and, and yes. documented all the evidence and, and appendices to all of the all yes. of the things that we needed to do. So she yes. she um, without her, it, it would not have um, been what it was. But um, yes. that, that application for statutory regulation was our opportunity as a as a um, growing professional group mm. to to um, uh, I guess, uh, measure ourselves against standards that were developed by the Health Professions Council for their regulated profession. Mm. And, and the sort of standards that we needed to, to demonstrate as a profession were 
um, our autonomous working. So were we truly a standalone profession? Um, we needed to show that we were evidence-based. And, and so uh, we were, I guess, at the, at the stage of genetic counselling where there was a lot of fantastic research going on. We had a lot of um, good evidence around, around our practice. Um, and we had to uh, develop... Um, evidence around our standards for education and training, mm -hmm. uh, which again, we couldn't have done without all of the registration and the GCRB um, uh, board. And, and we, we could put all of those um, um, standards into an application, which we submitted to the Health yes. Professions Council, I think in 2009, eventually. In December 2009. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. We were very happy. <laughs> we were. So standing on the steps at the Health Professions Council. Yes. We had yeah. just come out from doing the presentation. Yeah. We'd had to present in the, in a very large public meeting. Yes. Um, to the Health Professions Council. Um, and we were particularly, I remember, emphasising the work of genetic counsellors and, and the risk associated with our work and, and yes. the responsibility that we, we have as genetic counsellors to the patients and and their yes. families and uh, yes. yes they gave us they gave us a response on the day didn't they and told they us that um we we'd met the criteria and that we had presented a, a sufficient case that yes. they would um, recommend us for statutory and education. they i think a big thing and it you know we've had to compromise a bit recently but it recognized genetic counselors because do you remember the discussions and arguments about the use of the word counselors and there was a the health professions council at that time was challenged by having registration for psychotherapeutic counsellors and we got a bit sort of caught up in that that um mm. difficult discussions about that yeah because of course achieving statutory regulation would achieve a protected title yeah. um, wouldn't it and um the word counsellor isn't a protected title mm. and so they were worried that it that we 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 had a title that was a bit confusing yeah yeah, yeah, but we, we won that argument, didn't we? Yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> We've had to compromise a bit recently, but we, we won have. it back then. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 That seems it doesn't well, it it seems a long time ago, and then it just led to another whole big piece of work, which you that's the bit I remember you really leading on is the next the next sort of phase of it all. Yes. I, I think um uh, we we weren't disheartened by what was going on. We managed to to um, uh, remain motivated, I think. Um, and I, you know, having having been through the application process and um, working with the Health Professions Council, who who were extremely supportive mm. at the time, um, uh, I think made us feel that we we continued to have a case and that our work was relevant and important and that we should continue yes. um, thinking about regulation and, and continuing to work towards the high high standards that, that we we wanted um, for our patients and families and um, so when when the coalition government um, uh, made a definite de decision not to grant statutory regulation to any any new professions mm -hmm. coming in um, we uh, I guess we stayed um, stayed involved in those discussions and had an opportunity to uh, meet with um, the Council for Healthcare Regulatory Excellence. Yes. So one of my skills along this is to remember all the acronyms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that they were the CHRE and they, they had been tasked by government to develop a, an alternative, not an alternative, but a, a, a other regulatory routes that, that would be... Um, yeah. Uh, recognised in health, health and social care, um, and um, they uh, were looking, reaching out, I think, to different uh, professional groups who um, had um, uh, had applied for statutory regulation and who were interested in in ongoing work around regulation. And we worked, we worked um, uh, quite hard with them over many. Um, workshops they they uh, organize yeah. workshops to look at different standards around regulation and um i think because we had we'd done a lot of thinking about that through 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 the years for for the um regulation route it was really great to to get alongside different professional groups and think about what 
what regulation really meant and what the standards yeah. um, that they might want to develop for this new accredited register route. And I think because of the, the work the group did, but also your relationship with the, well, it became the PSA, which is not prostate specific antigen test, but professional standards authority. Um, because we were an interesting problem for them as well, I think, in that we were clearly health professionals. And it was almost clear that we were health professionals that should be statutory regulated, in fact. And so I think we were an interesting problem for them to yeah. try and help. So it, was a, so it was a mutually beneficial sort of thinking time. It felt it in, it definitely felt that in, in the early days yeah. that, that they um, they had quite a breadth of people around the table. And they, I think we were an interesting challenge. On the one hand, they, they, um, they would sometimes say you should be statutory regulated. Yeah. Some of the other groups around the table would say you should be statutory regulated. But at the same time, they were, I felt they were sort of interested in yeah. how can we, um, uh, so they, they were very complimentary, I feel, to us as a professional body, that we were very well organised, that we'd been self-regulating ourselves for a long time and, and that we were um, uh, a very sort of committed to safe practice and how could other systems continue to promote that and, and keep, that, um, yeah. keep that work going. And so they were, they were curious to see how they could uh, make this regulation route potentially beneficial whilst recognizing that perhaps in the long term statutory regulation would be a better yes better space for us yes. but um, yes. they they couldn't officially say no, that to the gift. and there was no. wasn't in their gift there was no route to do that no. and um we had to work with where we were yeah yes successfully though because we got psa accreditation we certainly did yeah. yes <laughs> there are more logos <laughs> Yeah, and, and that process I think was was again I mean these things are a lot of work but when you look back um, and even at the time I think when we were doing it we were recognizing the the benefits it was bringing to the GCRB to um, uh, you know really think think of, of how the GCRB could could um, uh, develop some of its systems and, and processes to to um, uh, to, to help safety and to help standards and, and things like that. So some things that came in were were, were really um, really good for the GCRB. Yes. Yes. Um, other things were were harder because we yeah. the GCRB isn't a statutory regulator and doesn't mm. have the the funds or the resources to act as a statutory regulator. Mm. So um, the the challenges that we had um, were the ones that we predicted. But you know, yeah. it's, yes, it's where we were. Yeah. Yes, and I think one of the in, it really focused the function of the registration process on protecting patients and public, mm -hmm. and yeah. focused us around thinking about risks and what we what the registration process did to mitigate against the risk mm -hmm. of harm to patients mm -hmm. and public. And that we probably needed to. It's you know none of this was intentional, but this is everything's building on everything else to lead us to where we are today and hopefully where we will be in the future yeah 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 and uh because it's because it was a voluntary system and um you know for for a number of years um uh the proportion of genetic counsellors who were choosing to do registration um was was not everybody mm -hmm. and um the proportion of um genomic genetic centers who were requiring registration was was again not all centers and so um uh, really um developing registration as 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 a as um you know a quality standard and mm -hmm. a standard that was about the patients um mm -hmm. i think has has really led it to be very firmly embedded in in certainly sort of nhs employment of genetic counselors and yeah. recognition that that GCRB registration is is the um, quality kite mark, as, as yes. the PSA used to call it, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for uh, you know for employers to know that they were yeah. they were employing um, effectively yes. professionals. Yes. As we talk, I'm just blown away actually by. Of course, I knew you did a lot, and I knew you contributed a lot, but I'm completely blown away. 
by how much because I'm thinking oh I must talk with her about that or I must talk with her about that (laughs) really honestly yeah so so Chris you've been a mentor for me through many of these years and it was you who said to me in those early days Georgie you can be chair and you can present at the HPC meeting and it was you that really said you know this 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 um you do have the uh, attributes and you can you mm-hmm. can challenge yourself to make that happen so um so you've been absolutely integral into my mm-hmm. into my ongoing passion but confidence to to stay involved and do what i can so um <laughs> and look how right i was <laughs> It's been, such, it's been such a team effort though hasn't it and I and I yeah. I think um this sort of integration and, and who who we've who we've been as a group of professionals who you know geographically we're spread all over the UK and um uh, but but we've we've really it, they, the work's been in our own time it's never been mm-hmm. something that's been funded from from anywhere um and uh, our kind of shared passion for our work and our profession has has uh, has just been amazing really and how how, yes. how well we've worked together and valued each other and and uh, yes seen a common goal yeah I think that's it the whole you know there's been loads of people that you know their names won't be mentioned but we know they're there and the people whose names get mentioned as part of this endeavor um it's because we've always had a We've had a common objective, which we've avoided the objective of creating a profession for a profession's sake. Mm -hmm. It's always been about um, quality Mm -hmm. and with the patient and our clients at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I really hope that we can keep holding on to that. Yeah. That's a really strong message for me because there's there's a lot of change um, going on at the moment and there's um, uh, yeah. conflicts, not the right word, but there's, there's a lot of kind of questioning about who, yeah. who's, who's doing what and how are we going to deliver all of these, these services. And, and generally as a profession, we've, we've had such passion for, for where the families are and what the families need and yeah. um, being able to continue to pull together um, with as many people as can yes. come on board to deliver that is is where we want to be. Yeah. So having trained at Manchester, you eventually became associated with the original MSC, but then the STP training programme. That must have mm. been a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> you were involved in the curriculum group for that as well, the curriculum development group for the STP programme, weren't you? So I was, yes. yes. I yeah. was. Um, uh, again, I don't absolutely know um, <laughs> how I got involved, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so the uh, again, the profession put together a, a small um, yeah. group of people who were interested in, in or had experience and skills to bring to curriculum writing. Um, and so that was led by the National School, wasn't it, I think, in Health yes. Education England. Um, I... I, I guess at that stage I was um, delivering modules on the MSc programme in Manchester. So I had some academic um, uh, experience in terms of, mm-hmm. of education in the university. and But I'd never written a curriculum before, but I also um, had, I think, kind of good, good knowledge of, of the GCRB competencies mm-hmm. as well. And, and clearly the STP programme was looking to um, bring together Um, an MSc and two years of training and amalgamate it into one package which had a um, uh, a very inflexible structure um, because it it was something we were um, given to put it we were given a structure it was an established program um, which was funded which was why it was uh, something that we were very keen we decided as a profession Um, Again, I think every every all of these stages we have sat down as a as as a professional body and thought, do we want to do this? What are the risks? What are the benefits? Yeah. And sat down and looked at our options, appraisals, and and yeah. you know, what if we don't do this? And we have it at each stage sat and thought about it, and and then made sure that we've been quite transparent with with the genetic counsellors around the UK about the decisions and why the decisions. Yeah. And what direction we're kind of moving in. So we did 
think carefully, but it was a great opportunity. Um, and I think some of the opportunities um, we hadn't foreseen that we're finding now, having gone down the STP um, uh, training route, but certainly at the time it was to, to get the opportunity of embedding funding into not, um, training for genetic yes. counsellors because it was uh, the MSC was self-funded and that, that is... Um, uh, um, restricts accessibility for people and then the training posts were um, few and far between mm. and so this was a way of, of, of ensuring our training model could could continue yeah. yes um so yeah we wrote that curriculum and then um uh we had to I'm thinking about six months to be absolutely frank wasn't it yeah, it, was it was incredible it was and again people being committed and working in their own time and mm. You know. mm. And then Manchester needed to respond to that yes. curriculum and build it. <laughs> and <wrote> course it. <laughs> modules. <laughs> well, you so, and Rona and Tara and everybody else at Manchester running the MSc programme, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, Cardiff had to yes. re-establish their programme. So I think as a kind of education, the sort of education deliverers um, uh, had, to, had to really work hard in that period yeah. and... and redesigned and recreated um, education very quickly and mm -hmm. you know again it's because we've had um, you know the workforce has been really important and that we we needed yes. to to get going again very quickly yeah um, and, yes. and now now a similar thing is hoping to happen around the HSST and so that's another curriculum group so that's that, a higher that, specialist training yeah that's yeah. right. So within yeah. the scientific training program, there's a higher specialist training. Yes. And, um, uh, that is an opportunity for us as genetic mm. counsellors to um, um, look at developing that route for, for mm. genetic counsellors as well in the future. Yes. yes. And you're really still straddling, though, the whole lot because you've got your ST scientific program, the STP training program coming out. And with um, and they will come out being registered as clinical scientists. Mm -hmm. You're involved also in the board, mm -hmm. and also in thinking about other ways of getting the registration system of the board also recognised. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Elaborate. <laughs> Elaborate where I think it's all going. Yes. <laughs> um. Okay, so because, because this is all about, um, I think, at the moment we are working, we're, we're opening the doors that we, we can uh, currently. Yeah. Um, and I am currently working on the equivalence route um, for genetic registered genetic counsellors with the GCRB um, mm. to uh, apply for equivalence with the um, HCPC as clinical scientists, and that's a route through the Academy of Healthcare Scientist um, register, um, mm. so that um, there is opportunities for genetic counsellors, whether they've trained through the STP or whether they've um, uh, trained before the STP and our, our um, GCRB registered genetic counsellors from other MSC background routes um, to enable um, uh, both those training routes into a statutory regulation um, space as, as clinical scientists. And at the moment, we are um, opening opening that, exploring that door and, and, and planning to open that door. Yes. Um, I uh, I I think um, like like a lot of these things, I, I had naively felt that because we had mapped the STP competencies and training so so carefully to the GCLB mm -hmm. competencies and training that that would be a a more straightforward um, uh, equivalence. But um, like like many things, there are. Um, uh, robust and, and important processes yeah. that are in place for, for good reasons and um, maybe I don't know how we could know about these things um, 
in the past for the future, which, you know, anyway, we, we keep, we keep learning and we keep um, yeah. understanding the next door. Um, yeah. But that's, that's the next step to, um, uh, towards uh, um, the opportunity for statutory regulation for genetic counsellors as um, within the clinical scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what do they call it? Within the HCPC, the clinical scientist, it's not a constituent group. Um, within the HCPC, there are different individual yes. groups, aren't they? The, the, yes. the, the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists yes. and clinical scientists is, is, is a group. Mm -hmm. and so we, we would be formally um, uh, statutory regulated as, as clinical scientists, but we yes. would maintain our, our title as genetic counsellors. And, and um, I guess a little bit like doctors have many letters after their yes. names yes. Um, yeah. we, <laughs> we we would yeah. i hope choose to um continue to recognize our gcrb registration mm -hmm. and that would very much be my my um qualification in into mm -hmm. statutory regulation but we would be able to to be clear about who who we were yes. and how we this, yeah. yeah 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 yes so you're still soldiering on <laughs> We're still working towards that, and it, it, it often feels disappointingly slow. These things, yeah. um, uh, but uh, you know, I think we've we've said already in this conversation that that we 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 uh, we're a small group of yeah. people, and we are all working full time clinically, and this is this is work that we do in our own time. So yes, yes, yeah, and I I think one of the reasons for me having these conversations was really to encourage and in, hopefully enthuse other people coming along by saying yes you can do this and it was just people that got together and did this mm. great people mm -hmm. but it was people that got together and, and did this mm -hmm. because we had, a, we had a common purpose mm -hmm. which we still have mm -hmm. yes and and we just have maintained a curiosity about what what yeah. the doors might be, and we've we yeah. just had a go at them really. Um, and a, a reality as well, a reality about the you know the way the world's changing, the ways genetic health and genomic health is changing, mm -hmm. and an ability to sort of explore that change. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So are there people that you wanted to mention that we've not mentioned? There's probably hundreds, but... <laughs> there probably are um, hundreds. I mean, I uh, we've talked about a bit about registration. We've talked a bit about education. I yeah. think um, uh, uh, I'd like to, I think, acknowledge some of the key researchers as well. Yeah. I think, you know, developing an evidence base around our work is really important. So Marion McAllister would be yeah. somebody I would um, uh, recognize as having um, really contributed to genetic counselor research in, in the UK and um, put us on an international sort of platform around mm -hmm. um, research into genetic counseling. And there are many, many people that would be listed along that, but just to recognize how, how as a research base, we've been working around that. Anna Middleton would be another yeah. one yourself, Chris as well. Um, and then uh, clinical leadership as well. We've had many genetic counselors who have um, worked in high leadership positions and, and represented genetic counselors. Again, Chris on the European board yourself, um, but um, you know we've we've had a lot of strong um, genetic counsellor uh, leads around the UK who have been um, demonstrating our our skills both at the kind of um, uh, hospital level leadership that's been important too. Mm. So um, yes, I, no, and no I'm dropping. But I know, and I. Also, I, I do this every time, actually, and, is, and you've done it as well, and most of the, the respondents have done it, is in the early days, our medical colleagues were incredibly important in, you know, al not allowing us, as a, but encouraging us to take the steps on this journey. Uh, you know, and you mentioned Didoni, yes, at Manchester. Yeah. And there were, there were many others. I mean, there's many others at Manchester as well. But, yeah, those early clinical geneticists... Uh, 
we really respected each other's skills and we respected each other's differences. And I think hopefully that is something that we can also take from the past to the future. Yeah. 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 Francis Flinter sitting around the table when I was doing my practice um, presentation for, for the HCC. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Giving up her time to, yes. to, you know, yeah. put me on, on the stand prepared for, for a very kind of, um, uh, professional environment of the HCPC. Yes. You know, our medical colleagues have very much been along yeah. alongside us, and I think it's important to recognise that. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else you wanted to cover? Um, I'm going to say very quickly that I did a little bit of thinking about the um, earliest genetic nurses and counsellors and yeah. their early um, uh, involvement. So just to briefly mention them too, because of course mm. we've we've followed in there. In yes. their footsteps and um, I was a genetic nurse to start off with <laughs> and in, Man in Manchester we had um, a genetic nurse called Mary Wheatman yes. um, that uh, and I was thinking for those early nurses and maybe Chris you, you'd feel in in those shoes and might uh, maybe I'm not right with this but I was thinking when when those early um, nurses and social workers came to work in in clinical genetics how um how how they they recognized that what was happening within genetics was different mm -hmm. and um they uh uh they they formed a professional group from a long 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 time ago and i and i i, I presume that happened because they felt they wanted you all wanted support from each other and you knew that you were sitting alongside something really different that was starting mm -hmm. and, and you wanted to um, get together and, and learn from each other and, and share each other's skills and experience. And that, so there was an, there was an insight right at the beginning that this, this, this wasn't nursing in, in, in the traditional yeah. way that, that, yeah. that people had trained, but they were walking into something a bit different. And, and um, I even wonder, I was listening to a lecture by Andrew Reid, who's always fabulous to listen to and, and reminds us really how much genetics has changed over the last 20, 25 years. And, and um, the nurses that kind of came in to such a new science and we were, you know, I remember we were doing CVBs with linkage and sexing and we really, you know, nowadays yeah. we have... We, we have such faith in our genetic test. There's so much that we, we just take that for granted. But mm -hmm. in those days, um, you know, we, we, it was really having a go around the edges and how, how you, how, how skilled um, the genetic nurses were in incorporating that in, in care for families and having faith in this kind of slightly whizzy science. I don't know how it must have felt at that time because it was so, so new, but how, how you, how how that was how that science was kind of brought into the care of families. I think yes. was, um, um, was something yes. to recognise really. Yes, yes, and and we had some incredible nurse leaders, and we had nurse leaders who were already nurse leaders in nursing, mm -hmm. and came into genetics, like Sally Sally Farnish. I don't know whether you knew Sally. Yeah, who was. Um, fearsome I have to say and Penny 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 Gilbert you know people like that it, it showed incredible leadership skills mm. um yeah yeah no and um I I mean I hope in the future I hope the new ways of training will bring more advanced you know people nurses that would be working at different levels back into they'll have their own roles in genomic medicine mm -hmm. just as important roles as genetic counselors but i hope it brings back some of them to, to mm -hmm. use their skills in genetic counseling mm -hmm. yeah i really do yeah okay are we done it feels like we're done 